Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Todd Ronan from Reality Forecast and at Reality Forecast on YouTube. And if you like this channel and if you like what Liz is doing and what I'm doing, please share this with five friends and think about joining Liz's Patreon, patreon.com forward slash remote viewing and beyond. Hey, Liz, how are you doing? Uh, I am great. Thank you. Thank you for the intro. Lovely. This is a common request of Hieronymus Bosch. He painted the Garden of Earthly Delights and about 20 or 25 other amazing works of art that were almost inspiration for surrealism in the 19th century. So I wondered if we could bring in the consciousness of Hieronymus Bosch and talk to him about his inspiration and in artwork. Yes, very complex person, very troubled soul plagued with mental illness and schizophrenia. What would he like to be called? Uh, hero. <laughs> I thought he'd be called Hero. I was going to call him Hero before he told me that. Hey, Hero, can you describe your creative process and what, where these ideas came from? This was all about mental torture, right? Thankfully, he was able to paint and he was, you know, very creative because the, he was tortured mentally with this schizophrenia, like voices. He couldn't make out what was talking to him. Uh, you know, it, it was very difficult for him. Very troubled person. Did you have a favorite type of iconography that you like to use in your paintings? Well, so he actually believed that the, the schizophrenia was like he was getting downloads. Um, but now he knows, obviously, that it was down to a mental illness. What sort of iconography? Did you, well, he would just like to use whatever was talking to him at the time. Um, that's where a lot of this stuff comes from. The objects would just have an opinion, have a voice. And he would try to recreate what, what it was he saw and what was going on in his mind. I mean, look at this right here. This is absolute chaos, right? Look, look at this. What is this painting? The Garden of Earthly Delights is most famous painting with three panels and chaos in the middle, Adam and Eve on the left, and the ending on the right side. This is, this is how his brain functioned. And I'm asking him, what was the ending? Because it has to end somewhere. Everything must come to an end. He says, even the universe will one day come to an end. And, and he was told, you know, through the schizophrenia. Now, Here's the problem with schizophrenia, okay? I don't know. I've heard psychics talk about this before, that schizophrenia is actually just taking in information from outside the body, outside the conscious mind, from somewhere in the matrix, and that information is like downloads and, and coming into the brain, right? But he's telling me now this is incorrect. This is the brain processing lots of chaotic information. It's a, it's a faulty wiring issue. And I'm saying, but where did this um, ending come from? And he said that was the ending that these certain things that were talking to him were giving to him. I mean, look at that thing with the ears and the knife. I mean, that, that's quite severe. Was it based on something real that was giving him information or was it just, where is that information then coming from that schizophrenics receive? It's coming from disorder in the mind. So where's our mind 
is predominantly organized and knows how to present information to, you know, the outside world, to ourselves. It's just total disorganization of the mind. And so you're, you're not getting just like the one voice. So I don't know about you, Ronan, but certainly, you know, I have a voice inside my head, not talking about what I channel or anything like that. I'm saying, you know, oh, well, I got to do dishes now. And I got, you know what I mean? Just sort of like, like the tasking voice, right? Now I got to take the dog for a walk. Now I got to do this. Now I got to cook dinner, right? That sort of voice. But when you have this disorganization and faulty brain wiring and, and faulty brain going on, uh, it's like all this information is just spilling in. It's not orderly. It's not, uh, there's no sort of rhyme or reason for, for the information that's pouring in. So it's just this brain chatter that we all have, but most of it is silenced. The irrelevant stuff is silenced. And, and but in, in this type of schizophrenic, schizophrenic brain, um, he was also quite paranoid as well. And it's just that that stuff sort of bleeds through. How does he feel about the enduring popularity of his work? Um, he feels quite privileged and proud um, of the fact that he was, you know, studied. Because people want to make sense of this stuff that he's painting. I don't feel like any of them know why he's, he's created these types of, of works. Can he tell us why he created these types of work? What was his motivation? It was to bring order to a disorder, a disorder brain, a disorderly brain. Um, it was the only way to calm his brain down and to keep himself occupied. Uh, if not, he was having like multiple conversations with himself. Much of his life has been lost to the ages and there are about 30 of his works that are known. Are there more than 30 that could be found are still available of his work? Uh, most of them have been destroyed, but he painted hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and drawings and sketches. Did he marry in his life? In your life? I feel like he did. I feel he's saying yes, but it, I don't think it worked out. I think it was um, a top secret. Uh, it didn't work out at all because obviously trying to live with someone um, that is not well, it is very difficult on the person. How did he make a living for himself? Did he get patrons? Did he do portraits for people? Yes, he would do paintings. Um, most people were unhappy with their paintings, but he just painted it like it was. Um, yeah, he, 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 um, it kind of reminds me. <laughs> I don't know if you you know about Churchill and the famous painter that that went to paint Churchill and when he presented the the painting the unveiling he was so disgusted with it and yet it was so like him but it disgusted him because he was obviously old and at that time he didn't want to see himself as an old person and and yeah so he would paint people as he saw them obviously his mind had this chaos and disorder going on so people most people were unhappy with their paintings but they they paid him up front they would have to commission him up front did hero travel outside of his region or did he pretty much stay in the netherlands no, not too much. He, he pretty much stayed in the Netherlands. He was a drinker as well. Was he influenced by other Flemish artists or Italian Renaissance? Or did he not really know about it? Yes, other Flemish artists, yes. Um, he hung, but they, you know, he was a very difficult person to get along with. 
right? So, you know, he did all, all of his relationships seemed short lived friendships and people couldn't understand him. He was just very difficult. Obviously, now we understand that he was suffering with schizophrenia and his eyes were very sort of strange as well. So um, I don't know. They just didn't really get along with him that very well. Was any of his suffering and maybe his eyes a result of him mixing his own type of pigments for himself? That's a good question. Um, was it any of the suffering because you mixed? No, no, no. It was, he was born with this mental illness. What but were see, his own? Go ahead. Sorry, but see, to, to that society at that time, that sort of gave him an edge, you know, the, and a, an excuse or a reason behind, um, his artwork, right? He's so unique. He's so different. And, but they didn't understand that that was because of the schizophrenia. How can his experience in the afterlife compare to the paintings that he created? Um, he feels very free in the afterlife because he, he's not trapped in a body that is suffering mental illness. Um, he was glad to leave the earth plane. He was almost like counting down the days until he could leave the earth plane. Uh, very happy about leaving. How did he die? He's showing me like he he's coughing into a cloth. Um, and I don't, uh, I don't understand that. What, what do you mean by, you know, you're coughing into a cloth? I feel like he was he was very, very ill, um, probably had some sort of lung disease or some sort of chest infection, maybe pneumonia. Uh, but he's he, when he's coughing onto the cloth, um, it's black. Did he experience any spiritual guides or helpers when he crossed over after his passing? Yes, he had, it's almost like he's showing me like two angels with wings met him at the gate and said, oh, you made it. Because prior to that, he'd always had some sort of deformity in other past lives or mental illness. And he always committed suicide. This was the first lifetime that he managed to live with his mental illness or his defection or what you know defect whatever it was um and he didn't commit suicide and the only reason he did commit suicide is because of the works of art that kept him from uh, committing suicide is there a place on the afterlife on the other side for only earth souls and then other planet souls? And has he ever, ever visited the other planet souls? What about souls from another planet? No, um, just earth souls. Just, um, and they may not necessarily all be earth souls. They could just be cut from source and they've never had a reincarnation. They have other jobs to do, um, but, you know, or they haven't re or they haven't incarnated yet. Uh, what about souls from other planets? He says, I have not met any from other planets. Do um, other planets with or other beings outside of source beings have souls? No. And that's something that I get all the time that outside of the source realm, that beings such as aliens or, you know, whatever, extraterrestrials, whatever you want to call them, Palladians, reptilian, I don't know. And I don't really care what you call them. But I find a consistency in the fact that they don't possess souls. Do you do activities on the other side or have any occupations that take up your time or any other pursuits that enrich your soul? in the afterlife? 
he paints on the other side as well. Absolutely. He's recreating uh, works of art from his previous lifetimes. Um, he really is such a great artist. Um, I'm looking at his paintings. He likes to paint angels and um, landscapes as well, instead of trying to paint all of this chatter and, and nonsense that he was getting in uh, his brain during that lifetime. In his opinion, what is the essence or core of the human soul? Um, in his opinion, yes. it's, we're all part of God. We're all one. Um, we're all connected and we're all part of God. So we were all once, you know, God, and then we separated and then we will return to God. So our souls are only temporary. Our souls are only temporary. And do our souls make up all of our incarnations? Are they a piece of that incarnation or are they a totality of it? It's one soul that experiences those incarnations. But once you've reached a top ascension level, you're reabsorbed back into source. Your job is over. You lose all character, thoughts, feelings, and emotions. And you lose sight of who you are. You are no longer anything. You are back into nothing, right? You're, you're reabsorbed and you are then God again. What does, has he incarnated since his incarnation as Hero Bosch? Yes, he's had two uh, incarnations since Hero Bosch. And one was in the 1800s, again, a painter. I feel at this time, were you in, no, he was in England. Uh, he again became very ill and left at quite a young age in that lifetime. And then he has since had another lifetime in the UK as a painter that was early 1900s, uh, probably left, how old were you? Around age 40. In his travels as Hero Bosch, did he have any meetings with any of the popes that were alive during his time? Were they intrigued by his art? He's like, these roles that we have on the earth plane, you know, they, they pretty much dissolve when we get up to the spirit world. It's like, oh, yeah, you were so-and-so. Okay. You know, well, there's not this attachment and revere to these people um, up there like we have on the earth plane. Right. And that yeah. dissolves. But, yes, I mean, has come across souls that were you know, very prominent figures, um, religious figures. Yes, but it's pretty much irrelevant when you get up to the spirit world. In his life as Hero Bosch, did he have any secret affiliations or other religious high affiliations that might have been lost to the ages? No, I feel like he wasn't religious at all. I mean, religion was like a, a way of life, as in you had to show that you were religious, but deep down, no, he wasn't religious. Um, he wasn't religious during his life? Not really. No, no. It was sort of a way of life. You know, there are some religions, which is more like cultural or um, social than it is about the religion. And that's what he was. But as far as like believing in God, listen, this guy was tormented, right? And it's hard to believe in God and Jesus when you are plagued with a brain that he had. Did he encounter criticism from other painters during his lifetime about his, the way that he portrayed art? And how did he react to those if he did? All the time, all the time, he would be told, like, you're not normal. There's something wrong with you. And he would just shrug it off. You know, well, this I paint what I feel. I paint what I see. And um, he just continued to 
carry on his work, but all the time he was criticized. What advice does he have for people that might be struggling with maybe mental illness or other problems in their life today that he wishes he knew about during his time? That you have to find a way of working through these problems. And whether it's schizophrenia, whether it's depression, whether it's, you know, um, bipolar or, you know, there's so many mental disorders out there. You have to find a way to keep the mind occupied, not with addictions, not with dark things, but with something like a hobby, some sort of creative way in order to keep your mind away from that illness. It's almost like you're trying to move your consciousness away from the illness. Well, thank you very much, Liz. Thank you, Hero Bosch. It's been fascinating to talk to you. You're a luminary among the art world and seeing your art, it's a beautiful window into a dark and twisted mind. Yeah. Yeah. Wasn't that amazing? I mean, did you expect any of that? I did not. Thank you very much, everybody. Please share (laughs) and subscribe and like, and we will see you next time. Yeah. Quite, uh, quite eerie. Thank you.